chapter 1, and we're going to start reading in verse 29. Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to start reading in verse 19. Um, and don't know if we're going to cover all 30 verses, but we're going to uh, look at a few things. just want to give you a little bit of, of background so you kind of understand when we pick up at verse 19 what's going on. Uh, the, the church in Philippi uh, is very special to the Apostle Paul. Matter of fact, 10 years earlier, the Apostle Paul planted this church. He stayed there. He ministered to the people. Uh, the church in Philippi was a very loving church, and he really enjoyed his time there, and, and then he moved on. And in the meantime, uh, a few years later, uh, Paul was arrested, and he's in a Roman jail cell. When he writes this letter, he's already been in prison for two years, um, and, and, and things are not looking good. And, and we do know that uh, he never did really make it out of the prison cell, that when he did make it out, uh, he was stood before Caesar and was later on executed uh, for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the, the church in Philippi, they had a special love for Paul also. And, and they were concerned, just like we're concerned with what uh, Brandon and the Ashkey's family is going through. And I know there's other families going through some real tough times. They were concerned. They want to know what they could do. They sent Aphrodite, one of his friends, and he goes and he ministers to the Apostle Paul. And... And he comes back, and he comes back, and, and, and Paul really, throughout the book of Philippians, he tells us that no matter what we're going through, we can still find joy in the worst of worst circumstances. And that's really one of the main themes in the book of Philippians, that, that you can have the joy of the Lord no matter what you're going through. And, and for Paul... He knew that that contentment, that happiness, was only found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You, you will not find that in anything else in this world. So, in, in verse 19, he says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So Paul said, even in the situation that I'm in, I'm okay. It's gonna, I'm going to be okay no matter what happens. Uh, he's telling the Philippian church, listen, don't, don't be worried about me. Um, what I'm going through is difficult, but I know that I'm going to get delivered from it. Paul is saying, I know, I know uh, tribulations I'm going through right now are only temporary, he says, either they're going to release me from prison or they will release me from this body through death. Either way, I don't care which one happens, I'm going to be fine with that. Now, I got to thinking about that. Would that be your answer? I'm in jail for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, there, there are now people inside the church since he's been in jail who, who are jealous of the Apostle Paul's ministry. So they're starting to try to smear his name. He, he's, he's, he's having to deal with that. He's having to deal with, with what the Romans are planning on doing with him. And he's also always writing letters and praying for the churches that he planted. And he's always witnessing to the guards. But he says, you know what? I'm in a really bad situation right now. I'm in a situation that I don't want to be in. But you know what? If I live, I'm good. If they kill me in a few minutes, praise the Lord. That would be great. I'm going to be with Jesus. Whether I'm alive in this body or whether I've been released from this body, I love the Lord. And that's, that's pretty remarkable faith. When, when you start looking at the book of Philippians and understanding just exactly what the Apostle Paul was going through, it's a whole lot easier to teach this lesson than to live this lesson out in real life. Uh, because let's just face it, when, when we go through hard things, when, when we see some of the things that, that uh, some of my people in our church are going through, it's, it's, it's hard to have that joy that the Apostle Paul had. But in, 19, in verse 19, if you look at that, uh, I want to tell you that there are two great things that, that, great, that gave the Apostle Paul great comfort. Can anybody pick out what those two things were? 
He had two great supports that, that was helping him in his time of need. Prayers and the supply of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Well, in this verse it says, from your prayers and the abundance of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. So he knew that he had the intercessory prayers of the church. That was very comforting to Paul while he was in prison. You know what kind of support I call this? This is brotherly love. This is what we should do for one another. This is human support. We need human support. But you just can't have that alone. If you're having to go through what some people are having to go through, if you're having to go through what the Apostle Paul's going through, human support will only take you so far. He said, not only do I have that, I have the divine support of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. One of the things that we would always need to do as a church family is to pray for one another. I can personally tell you it's a great encouragement to know that, that you have people praying for you. Um, I just got finished uh, the other day talking to uh, Chuck and Connie. He just went through open heart surgery. He said, you know, I just had this great peace because I knew that I had so many people praying for me. Uh, what Brandon and Katie are going through, it's, it's tough, but they are so thankful that you have, they have this church family praying for them. Uh, and it's important that, that we do this. Uh, sometimes uh, we say that we'll pray for somebody, and guess what happens? We lie through our teeth. <laughs> we, we don't pray at all. We say, I, I'm going to pray for you. And, and, and we don't. Uh, that's why you, you should take time. If, if you was to walk into our house, we have a big whiteboard set up, and we have the names of the people, mainly in this church, that, that need prayer. Because without that, I, I'm just going to be honest with you, I, I'll forget to pray for them. So it's, it's good to have something written down so you know who, who to pray for. Um, Charles Spurgeon, when he was preaching, he was, he was one of the greatest preachers uh, that, that has been known. He's like the Apostle Paul of his day. And at the height of his ministry, he had so many burdens on him that he would go into deep battles of depression. He, he, would, he would be so depressed that he didn't even want to get out of bed. And one day, Charles' wife uh, came walking in there, and she had all black on. She had a black veil on. And Charles looked at it and said, you going to a funeral? And she said, yeah. Then you hear God died. And he said, don't talk like that. You should never say anything like that. You know God didn't die. And she said, I know, but you need to start living like it. That's great advice. No matter what you're going through, God already knows what, what we're having to face. Um, then Paul said he had the full supply of the Holy Spirit. We know the main role of the Holy Spirit is to make us holy. Uh, we know that the Holy Spirit seals us into the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit it uh, illuminates and reveals God's Word to us to help us understand the Word of God as we study it. Uh, the Holy Spirit will enable us to pray uh, when we are weak and or even when we're not sure what to pray, the Spirit will pray on our behalf. The Holy Spirit is also the source of the believer's power. A power especially uh, is made effective when we're at our weakest moments. Um, when we find ourselves in hardships, when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, uh, it's the Holy Spirit that can give people, like the Apostle Paul, it's the Holy Spirit that gives people that we see that are going through great hardships and circumstances. You just see they still have a joy, a spark. They still have a happiness that, that health problems, that death, that nothing can steal. That is the Holy Spirit. That is part of the fruit of the Spirit. That's one of the blessings that you have from the Spirit. So Paul was not dependent on his own dwindling resources. He was dependent on the generous resources of God. 
he was being ministered to uh, by uh, the Holy Spirit. So my advice would be we need to take we need to take his advice. When we're going through something, we shouldn't be ashamed to ask someone to pray for us. You don't have to broadcast it to the whole church. You don't have to put it on social media. But everybody in your life, you should have two or three people that you know that you can call right now and ask them to pray. And you know that they're going to pray for you. You can't put a value on that. It's, it's amazing to have that. And not only do you do that, humble enough to do that, you also have to depend on the Holy Spirit. Um, we need to renounce self-reliance in those situations. We need to uh, ask the Holy Spirit and rely on the Holy Spirit to, to help us in our time of need. And then in verse 20, he says, According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or death. He says, man, I, I have nothing to be ashamed on how I live for the Lord. Now, I wish I could write that. <laughs> Paul couldn't write that before his conversion. And, and, and maybe I'm pretty sure there are things that he stumbled. He wasn't perfect. But, but he says the, the, my, my purpose in life to magnify the Lord, to make Jesus Christ known, I'm not ashamed of how I did that. I, I gave it everything that I had while I could. Paul wanted to be used to magnify Jesus. Uh, to magnify something, you do what? You make it while you can, you know. I, I thought I was going to have to put these reading glasses on tonight to magnify the page so, so that, it, that I could see it more clear so it would be closer. Um, when we look at the stars, what do we use to, if we really want to make them look closer? We, we use a telescope, and that telescope magnifies the, the star that, that is there. And, and so we as believers, everything that we do, uh, we're either doing one or two things for other people. We're either magnifying Jesus Christ with our actions and with our life, or we're doing the opposite. We're, 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 we're making Jesus uh, small. Now, I want my life to make a difference in the lives of others for the glory of gospel, and I believe one of the most awarding purposes for living is to live to fulfill God's will and plan for your life. To let your life be a lens that will magnify the love of Jesus. And I believe when followers of Christ start to magnify Christ more, then we minimize Christ with our actions, with our words, with our deeds. Uh, we would be a true lighthouse that would draw the unchurched to our Savior. Um, we still need to use our words um, so they can see what is different in us, but, but somebody that's unchurched, the, the Bible that they're reading is not the Bible that they have at home or the Bible that they study on their lunch break. The only Bible of truth that they will study is your actions because they know that you go to church and you say you are a believer. Paul was determined uh, that Christ may be magnified, that he dedicated his body to that very end, whether it be life or death. For he said in verse 21 of our text, for me to live is Christ. That's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live for the gospel. And if I die, he says, that is even better if you want to work with the translation. Whether I'm freed or in prison, he said, I will magnify the Lord in all situations. Even if I'm killed, Paul said, in death, God will still be exalted in my body, for I will have died for his name. I have died as a testimony to my unwavering faith. So when Paul says to die as gain, Paul knows death is the entrance into gain, not the exit from living or the end of one's existence. And a lot of people see it as that we're losing everything. It's the end of existence, and we're leaving everything behind, uh, and they're not seeing what they are gaining if they are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Kelly said today that 
Uh, it's, it's funny that we spend all our time praying people to keep them from going to heaven instead of praying people for them to go to heaven. I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, never really heard it that way before. One commentary said to die for an unbeliever is to give up all your possessions, but to die for a believer is to gain your greatest possession. Paul knew that death is not a defeat to the Christian, but is merely a graduation to glory. Uh, if you're an accountant, you would, you would put that as a net gain. So when, when a follower of Christ dies, he or she is fully and, and finally beginning to live because that person passes into the perfect, eternal, glorious union with Christ, unhindered by the world, the flesh, and the devil. So Paul is trying to communicate to depart and be with Christ is but by far, it's beyond all expression. In other words, he's really saying, I don't even have the vocabulary to describe how much but it is going to be to live with Christ than to stay here in this world. Um, but then he said this in verse 22. I think if Paul had to choose which one he wanted to do, I think he'd have said, sign me up right now and beam me on up. I'd rather be with Christ. So if that could happen right now, we, we could say, you know what? We can go be with Christ or we can stay here and labor in this sin-cursed world. But you got to make your decision up in the next 10 minutes. How many are going to heaven tonight? Or how many are going to say, whoop, wait a minute, Pastor. <laughs> I ain't ready. I, I would at least be like, I, I got to get Ben and Matthew and Hope on board. If they're in, man, I'm in. So, but, but Paul was really, I, I'd rather be with Christ. Then he says, but if I live, in other words, if, if, what do you think the Philippian church is praying for? That he be what? Not killed, that he would be released from prison. He says, but if I live in this flesh, he says, this is the good part. I'm going to bear more fruit from serving the Lord. I'm going to save some more people to Jesus Christ. I'm going to plant another church. I'm going to build the kingdom of God, so that is good if I had to stay here. We, we don't have that mentality. And Paul is saying in our text, if I live through this, I'm going to see more spiritual fruit from my labor. Do you know why he's in jail? And so he's going to go, it, they release you from jail. You've been in there two years in a dungeon. Two years you ain't slept on your bed. Two years you ain't had coffee in the morning. Two years you ain't had air conditioning. You ain't had a shower. And they let you out. And you know what he's going to do just as soon as he can? The same thing that got him thrown in jail. <laughs> That's what he's going to do with his life. Spiritual fruit, I want y'all to hear this, in your life is a sure proof that one has experienced genuine salvation. So a good question to be asked, well, well what is spiritual fruit? What, what is the fruit a spiritual. I mean, what, what does that look like? Because we automatically think, man, that, that person is just winning people to Christ one after another. Well, that is spiritual fruit, God working through you. But if you only look at it in that context, you, you're missing the, 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 all of what spiritual fruit is. Spiritual fruit is when you're in hard situations like this, that you still love and can serve the Lord that you still have a joy in your heart that those circumstances cannot take away, that you're still content with the situation that you're in. You may not like it, but you know what? You're going to be okay. That, that's spiritual fruit. Spiritual fruit is how you treat people. Spiritual fruit is you're able to control your tongue. Spiritual fruit is, is so many things that, that people see when we live out the Christian life. A false profession will not produce fruit it's, if you got a false profession you're not going to have spiritual fruit in your life Luke chapter 6 says for a good tree does not bear 
bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from, uh, from a bush. And also, I don't want us to miss the word labor in verse 22. Uh, he says, if I get out, I'm going to labor for the Lord. What, what is labor? Hard work. Okay, so do, do, do we define laboring for the Lord and having to get out in 94 degree weather tonight on a Wednesday night and drive to church? <laughs> Is that labor? All right, getting up on Sunday morning to come to God's house to worship what God has done for you. Is that labor? What are you doing? What can you put your finger on and say that's labor? I'm, I'm, this is what I'm doing to serve the Lord. No, no. no. That's right. But it's work. It's 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 you're 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 doing something. Uh, so, but he 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 looked at it as a pure joy. You're you're absolutely right about that. Paul Paul I I think is just. If we want to be spiritual fruitful, uh, it requires labor on our part. When you do your part, God, I have found, will always do his part. Uh, you cannot reach spiritual fruit by doing nothing. Now, I'm, I'm a long way from a math scholar. How I graduated with my degree from seminary, I don't know. Uh, but math was bad. You think my English is bad. <laughs> You ain't seen nothing. Now, normal math, adding, subtracting, multiplication, division, stuff that you need in life, that's no problem. But algebra and stuff like that, it, it was bad. So I, I'm no, no math scholar. But I know this. It, it's, it's, it's very simple. Nothing plus nothing equals what? My point is, if you do nothing for the Lord, you're going to equal nothing in spiritual fruit. If you're willing to do something, it, it could be something small. Next week can be the hottest week of the year. Every afternoon, I'm going to be doing a vacation Bible school horse camp. Do you really think I want to be out there? If it had been seven degrees, I would have wanted to be out there. But I know that through that, a seed of the gospel might change some young person's life who's never heard of the gospel. I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to give up a whole week of my life uh, for a ministry outside of this church to, to help maybe someone hear the gospel for the very first time. All I'm saying is, I have found that when I'm willing to do something, that's when God can come in and do something. So something plus something will equal some type of spiritual fruit um, if you're just willing to do that. Um, I just found God can't bless nothing. Um, he's not going to do what we should be doing. So if we want to see spiritual fruit in our lives, we have to be intentional with our time, put forth effort in serving the Lord, and when we do that, we will see a harvest that endures for time and eternity. So, um, just something to think about. Um, a little bit, maybe tonight when you're laying down. Over the past year, why don't you try to write down spiritual fruit that you've seen in your life? And just see what that tells you. Verses 24 to 26. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for ye. And being confident of this, in other words, if this is God's plan, if, if I'm released, I know that he still has a plan for my life. It's going to be beneficiary to, to the people I get to minister to. I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for the progress of joy of the faith, 
that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Now, when, when, when I was just reading about what Paul's going through and, and, and I look at the legacy that he left behind, I mean, just think about how often on Sunday mornings we're studying one of his letters that he wrote or the, the model that he was for us to follow. I got, I got to thinking about uh, the life of Ananias Judson. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him or not. I know y'all probably heard me talk about him. But, but a few years ago, one of the, the first biographies that, that, I, that I read of a missionary that really sparked my interest to want to go on missions was a book called The Golden Shores. And the book is about that thick. And, and I read it in three days. If I could have stayed up long enough, I would have finished it on one reading. I just, it just pulled me in. It's one of those books that, that God was just speaking to me. I, I, I couldn't put it down. But uh, Ananias Judson was the, one of the first American missionaries that went overseas. Um, he went to Burma, which is now Miramar. Uh, matter of fact, we now support a pastor in Miramar, our church. And uh, he was a brave ambassador for Jesus Christ. Uh, so I, I wish I could, I, I don't have the letter, but I wish I could uh, let you read the letter that he wrote to his wife's uh, father about asking for his daughter's hand in marriage. But before you give away, know that this is what we're about to do with our life. And if you can't live without her, do not give her away. It, it was just really moving. But he, uh, 14 years after he uh, endured wretched imprisonments, life-threatening diseases, all that he had to show for his, for, for his first 14 years of ministry in Burma uh, was the graves of his wife and every single one of his children. They died with disease over there. He was alone, yet he was faithful to remain there. He wrote that he had not felt certain that every trial was ordered by God's infinite love and mercy. He could not have survived all the uh, sufferings that he and hardships that he had to go through. And I judged and understood his trials were part of the sovereign plan of God. And although he must have longed to be with Christ and enjoy the fellowship of his beloved family, he also longed to see these pagan Burmese people come to Christ. He was there for over seven years for he had one convert of ministering every single day. Therefore, he prayed that God would allow him to live long enough until he translated the entire Bible into the Burmese language and to pastor long enough to see a Burmese church with at least a hundred new believers. So Judson had the spirit of the Apostle Paul. He longed to be with Christ, but he also desired to be useful for God in this world. Uh, Adonai and Judson departed to be with Jesus April 12, 1850, completing the laborious task that God had given him. Uh, I think it was about three years ago uh, I went to Burma. I mean, I always wanted to go there after I read the book. And uh, hopefully, uh, soon, that uh, with the coup settling down, hopefully I will get to go back maybe next year. But I always wanted to go and, and, and just, just see the country, see some of the things, some of the sights uh, that, that he had to, to face. So uh, about three years ago, I partnered with uh, Rick Vine and World Reach Ministries, and uh, we went to Burma. And I uh, got to meet an uh, amazing man of God. I uh, was just blown away by the ministry of Pastor Ling. Uh, he's been through so much these last two years through the pandemic, uh, through the military coup that's going on. I mean, he's seen people killed, houses burned down. Uh, the price of rice and everything has just skyrocketed. And not only does he pastor his church and oversees several other churches, he also oversees 30 orphans. That, that, that are living with him. They, he don't have to take care of them, but he said, God called me to take care of the widows and the orphans, and how can you call yourself a church if you won't take them in? We have a government over here to take them in. You know how he gets support to feed those kids? He prays that people like us would give to his ministry so that he can feed them. He, he's just an, an amazing person, but... 
One, one of the things that, that, that really touched me uh, when I went over there is, uh, do you know that every Bible that I saw a believer had in their hand, do you know what translation it was? The Ananias and Judson Bible. Do you know we gave away about 100 Bibles, and that's, you think some people are funny about the King James only translation here? That's only one translation, so you don't even have to argue about it over there. That's only one biblical translation. That's the Ananias and Judson Bible. just want to read, read something to you with there about this. Burma is still mainly a Buddhist nation. The statistics that I researched said only 8% of the estimated 54 million people in that nation are followers of Christ. But do you know what 8% of 54 million is? It means that there are over 4 million Christians in that nation today. Do you know how many Christians were in Burma in 1813 at the age of 25 when Ananias Judson got there? Zero. His labor, 170 years later, continued to reap gospel fruit in Burma. Can you imagine living and serving the Lord in such a way that after you've been in heaven for over 170 years, that people are still getting saved? Do your ministry. They had it locked, but uh, they, his church that he pastored down there was still up. And I, I wanted to go in there, but I, I, I couldn't get, get a chance to go in there. But I was right out in front of it and, and then got to share the gospel uh, uh, out there with people uh, in that little park that was out in front of it. But I want the way I labor for the Lord I want the way that I serve the Lord. I want the things that, that I do, ministries that I help with. I, I want to have an impact on, on, on people that for many years after I departed to be with Christ, that I hope that, that something I said or something I've done or something I instilled in somebody or something that I instilled in my children, that legacy is being passed down to the next generation. So I hope my life will impact the nations for the kingdom of God. Uh, one of the pastors in Uganda, I, I sent him my, my uh, started sending him my manuscripts to my text, so he'll have uh, the resources that uh, he he's got email and he doesn't have all the things that I have. So I, I started after I preach a sermon, I, I just send it right on his way. Uh, so I hope those things will one day uh, just make a huge difference uh, for the kingdom of God. Now, I don't want anybody to feel guilty for having a strong desire to enjoy life. I, I mean, I think Paul still had that. I mean, I, I know I have a strong desire to enjoy life. I had a really good time last week uh, at Emerald Isle. I know Sandy's going next week when I'm laboring out there in the horse camp for the Lord. <laughs> She'll be laid up on the beach. But that's okay. We, we, we want to enjoy our marriage. We want to enjoy our family. Uh, I think we all want a fulfilling job. We, we want something that, that, that makes a difference. We like to travel. We want recreation. Uh, it's nothing wrong with those things. But if the delights of our earthly home are so attractive that we lose sight of God's purpose and we lose sight and, and we don't serve the Lord, we really need to refocus and understand. The Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, that we should labor in them, that we should do them. All right. Well, I think I'm going to stop right there tonight. Any questions? Who's going to share that?